House Speaker Mike Johnson is sending impeachment charges against Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate today, forcing senators to convene a trial on the Homeland Security Secretary. We'll hear more from NTD's Washington correspondent Luis Martinez. What is China's role in the U.S. opioid crisis? A congressional committee reveals the communist regime is subsidizing illicit fentanyl production, escalating America's opioid emergency. On the second day of the Trump case, more New Yorkers will fill the courtroom today as jury selection continues. NTD's Arlene Richards brings us the highlights. Who's protecting your kids on their smartphones when you're not watching? A new California bill aims to keep kids from exposure to adult content. And the pilots union at American Airlines says there has been a significant spike in safety issues with the airline. We'll tell you what measures they're taking. Welcome to NTD Newsroom. I'm Stephanie Cox. House Speaker Mike Johnson is sending impeachment charges against the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate today, forcing senators to convene a trial. NTD's Washington correspondent Luis Martinez is bringing us more from Capitol Hill. Luis, can you tell us what happens today? Of course, Steph, a good afternoon. So earlier today, for the 22nd time in U.S. history, House managers delivered articles of impeachment to the Senate floor. This time around, two articles of impeachment against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. Now, the next step is that on Wednesday, senators will be sworn in as jurors, and Senator Patty Murray, a Democrat from Washington, will preside over the impeachment proceedings. So, Steph, a very historic day here in Congress. Uh, thank you so much, Luis. China is directly subsidizing production of illicit fentanyl precursors for sale abroad and fueling the U.S. opioid crisis. That's according to a congressional committee. Members released documents today showing findings from an investigation it said unveiled Beijing's incentives for the deadly chemicals. As our committee investigation unveiled today, the CCP is subsidizing, awarding, and, and investing in, in chemical companies that are responsible. They're failing to prosecute these companies or collaborate with U.S. law enforcement, essentially conducting forms of legal and illegal statecraft to unleash an all-out drug warfare in a, what I think, not so covert effort to weaken their opponents and overthrow the democratic system. The PRC and the CCP are not just bystanders. They are prime movers. First, the committee's investigators have found a hidden PRC government website currently fully active that offers complete tax rebates incentivizing the export of all fentanyl analogs and precursors as well as other synthetic narcotics, drugs that are illegal in the U.S., illegal in China, and have no legitimate purpose. The tax rates are among the highest offered and allow companies to effectively operate tax-free when they export fentanyl precursors. Second, the committee's evidence shows that the PRC provides grants and awards to companies that are engaged in open and notorious synthetic narcotic manufacturing and drug trafficking. Since the biden she meeting, would you say, uh, based on your own knowledge, Mr. Barr, and the findings of this report, that the PRC has in any way meaningfully taken any steps to reduce um, the production of fentanyl precursors? I'm not aware of any material steps that they've taken. And we'll have more on this hearing in today's Capitol Report at 5 p.m. Eastern to Pacific. So tune into that. Next up, the historic criminal trial of a former American president. The first ever continues today. Prosecutors are charging Donald Trump with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records regarding to money he paid to former adult film actress Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. NTD's legal correspondent Arlene Richards breaks down the major developments for Monday and what's expected for today. Prosecutors on Monday asked the judge for clarification on some evidentiary rulings that Judge Mershon previously made. And in asking for that clarification, the prosecution seemed to be laying out some of their case. In particular, how they are going to corroborate Michael Cohen's testimony. 
Cohen is their star witness, but they have a problem because he is a convicted liar. So they will need to present other evidence and testimony to support what he says. They want to present evidence such as the Access Hollywood video, which has Trump in the background making a derogatory comment about women. And the testimony of Karen McDougal, the model and actress who says she had an affair with Trump in 2006 and he paid her $150,000 to keep quiet. The judge did not allow them to show the jury the Access Hollywood tape, but he is allowing Ms. McDougal to testify. On the defense side, the judge quickly denied their motion, asking him to recuse himself. The defense is most concerned about whether or not Trump can get a fair trial. And they have been arguing that the jury questionnaire is not fair because it doesn't ask the jurors whether or not they like Trump. But the judge is allowing jurors to leave if they say they can't be fair and impartial, or if they had some other obligations. Out of 96 prospective jurors brought in yesterday, around 60 were excused and about 10 were questioned by the end of the day, and one of them was dismissed. This morning, around 32 potential jurors returned for either questioning by the attorneys or questioning by Judge Mershon. The judge was also expected to hold a Sandoval hearing. This is a process that is unique to New York in which the prosecutor has to reveal to the judge what previous bad acts of the defendant they plan to bring up at trial. The judge will weigh whether or not it would be too prejudicial to Trump. For example, they wouldn't be allowed to talk about the other pending indictments. And the jury selection process is continuing today. The attorneys will choose from hundreds of New Yorkers, so this process could take some time. But it appears that many of the jurors are saying they can't be fair and impartial, and others have different reasons for not wanting to serve. And President Biden is on a multi-city tour of the battleground state of Pennsylvania today. His first stop is his hometown of Scranton, where he's renewing calls to increase taxes on wealthy Americans and large corporations. I learned a lot here in Scranton. I learned that money doesn't determine your worth. My grandfather would tell me, Joey, nobody, nobody's more worthy than you and everyone's your equal. And that was, a, no, that, that was. I learned that no one's looking for a handout. All anybody wants is a fair shot, a fair shot at making, and they deserve a fair shot. Biden will head to Pittsburgh on Wednesday and Philadelphia on Thursday to campaign on tax and economic policies and to counter Trump. Trump was in eastern Pennsylvania on Saturday for a campaign rally that drew thousands of supporters. Pennsylvania is a top prize with its 19 electoral votes and voters who swing between backing Democrats and backing Republicans. Biden won Pennsylvania in 2020 by less than 1.5 percent, or roughly 80,000 votes. Trump beat Hillary Clinton there by fewer than 45,000 votes in 2016. Polls show another close race. And Iran was the focus of a series of bills passed yesterday by the Republican-led House. The bills target Iran's finances in response to the recent attack on Israel. The bills were quickly approved through a process needing a two-thirds majority. They aim to impose financial penalties on Iran and its supporters. The bills include ending tax exemptions for nonprofits backing terrorist groups, disrupting China's purchase of Iranian oil, and preventing Iran from using the U.S. financial system. The bills were mostly uncontroversial and have backing from most Democrats. Israeli leaders say they fully coordinated with the Pentagon to repel the massive Iranian attack over the weekend. Amid a barrage of drones and missiles, Israeli forces relied on their Arrow 2 and Arrow 3 high-altitude defense systems. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the anti-ballistic technology. Zivka Hamovich is a retired brigadier general and former commander of Israel's air defenses. He said Iran launched about 300 weapons toward Israel. The munitions included one-way drones, cruise missiles, and surface-to-surface -surface missiles. The fact that it's a mix between UAVs and cruise missiles and missiles on the same uh, time, it means that the sky picture is very uh, busy, very complicated to know exactly where are the targets, where are the enemies, where are the, the friends in this. 
Haimovich said the interception of an unprecedented volume of weapons proved the efficacy of the arrow systems. And I uh, think that uh, the fact that uh, we are talking today about uh, 99 uh, uh, percent of uh, success interception by the arrow 2, the arrow 3, it means that we build it uh, correct, right, effectively to deal with the relevant uh, threats for us. Arrow's interceptor missiles reportedly cost between $2 million and $3.5 million apiece. In 2022, Israel said it was developing a more cost-effective laser-based missile shield. I believe that in the near future we will see the first phase of the laser system. It will not replace the system that we mentioned, not the Iron Dome, not the Bisling, and not the others. It will be part of this integrated system. It will help. The other uh, system deal with this massive uh, threat. Now Israel needs to prepare for the next threat from Iran. We need to take as an assumption that the Iranian will make their own work next uh, time. And they will try to challenge our uh, system. That means that we need to be one step before and not after our enemies. The United States, Britain, France and Jordan helped Israel intercept the bulk of the weekend salvo. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The Pilots Union at American Airlines says there has been a significant spike in safety issues with the airline. Those problems include fewer routine inspections and shorter test flights on planes after major maintenance work. A spokesman said yesterday that union officials have raised their concerns with senior managers at American. He added that they were encouraged by the airline's response. The Fort Worth-based carrier says it has an industry-leading safety management system. An airline spokesperson added that American is in regular contact with regulators and unions. The union said Americans has increased, American has increased the time between routine inspections on planes. The group added that the airline also does abbreviated test flights on, major, on planes after major maintenance checks or long-term storage. And President Biden is making it easier for pregnant workers who have undergone abortions to now qualify for reasonable accommodations from their employers. Yesterday's ruling by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission falls under the agency's Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. It requires employers to offer reasonable accommodations to workers affected by pregnancy, childbirth or related medical conditions. One congressional Republican says adding the abortion provision is simply wrong. Virginia Fox, the chairwoman of the Committee on Education and the Workforce, is slamming the rule. She says abortion is not a medical condition related to pregnancy. And in West Virginia, a federal appeals court strikes down a rule banning transgender athletes from playing in women's sports. The state's attorney general, Patrick Morrissey, stated today that he will keep fighting to protect West Virginia's Save Women's Sports Act. He points out that the act is in line with Title IX. He added it allows for women's safety and for girls to have a truly fair playing field. California is considering a bill today that would make it the 13th state to require pornographic websites to keep minors from accessing their content. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the measure which would require adult websites to take reasonable steps to verify that users are adults. Assembly Bill 3080 was proposed by Assemblyman Juan Alanis. The lawmaker says the risk of California youth being exposed to pornography has never been greater. With the average age of exposure between 7 and 13, the lawmaker says exposure to adult content for such young kids can create lasting damage to personal relationships, self-confidence and body image. According to the bill's fact sheet, some studies have shown correlations between porn consumption and sex trafficking, child pornography and sexual abuse. Helen Taylor works with the organization Exodus Cry. Its website says it is committed to abolishing sex trafficking and to assisting and empowering its victims. Taylor says a leading mental health and addiction clinic recently saw a 150% increase in porn addiction among youth. They're often seeing extremely violent um, and intense hardcore graphic content that's depicting violence against women that is causing anxiety, depression. Taylor says around a third of youth who are addicted to pornography were first exposed at school. 
parents are doing the best they can. They're putting on the filters on their computers and devices, doing the best they can to protect their children. But unless these pornographic websites also take this seriously, a child can go to school or go to a friend's house and be shown this content outside of the care of the family. The Exodus Cry VP says pornography should not be able to operate like the Wild West online with no regulations. We need to prioritize protecting children from pornography. And if the porn websites are not willing to do that, then we're having to call upon our lawmakers to ensure that they do. Assembly Bill 3080 will require websites that host pornographic content to employ the use of age verification software. Age Verification Providers Association Director Ian Corby says the essence of age verification is proving your age without giving away who you are. One method is using a selfie to estimate age. Corby says the image never needs to leave your own control. You know, technology can put a man on the moon. You know, we can definitely prove your age without jeopardizing your anonymity or putting any of your personal data at risk. It's not rocket science. The bill would prohibit the companies who perform these age verification requirements from retaining personal information of users. Corby says such bills to protect kids are a no-brainer, and he hopes to see a federal-level law in the near future. I mean, you have to remember the internet was never designed with children in mind. Um, and I think we'll look back in 10 years' time on the complete anarchy that there is right now in terms of what we allow our children to see and do and who can talk to them when they're online and be quite horrified at, at this, at the situation we've allowed to arise. Similar age verification bills have already passed in 12 states and have been introduced in 23 others. Last month, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals supported a Texas law that demands age verification for pornography websites. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. When we come back, five years ago, Parisians were stunned as the Notre Dame Cathedral went up in flames. Amidst tears and memories, the event left an enduring impact on the city. We take a look. And Americans are saving less these days. Find out why in today's business brief after the break. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslan and perilla seeds, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium, and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7, and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritan Omega-3 does not smell of fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritan Green Vegetable Omega-3. Greener, healthier, and more effective. Visit puritang.com to learn more. What if you could whiten your teeth by simply brushing your teeth? Now you can with Smile Actives, the teeth whitening breakthrough that safely gets your teeth white and keeps them white every day just by brushing your teeth. I never thought that whitening my teeth could be so easy. I just put the gel on the brush, the toothpaste on it, brush, and I can see my white teeth. Simply add Smile Actives to any toothpaste and our patented PolyClean technology activates into a powerful microfoam that penetrates into the enamel surface to safely lift and remove stains. You need a simple way to whiten your teeth without strips, without trays, without going to the dentist. And it was about time that a product was developed that you would be able to do that with just brushing. And now Smile Actives is even better with new Pro Whitening Gel with 33% greater whitening power, clinically shown to whiten teeth faster, up to eight shades. 100% of users saw whiter teeth on food stains, coffee and wine stains, even on veneers, crowns, and dentures. I eat the blueberries, I drink the coffee, and I know that Smile Actives will keep my teeth white every day. If you could use something so easy like Smile Actives to take yellow teeth to white teeth, why wouldn't you? Why spend hundreds of dollars for whitening treatments at the dentist when now you can whiten your teeth with new Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel every time you brush your teeth? Call or go to smileactives.com and for a limited time, get new Pro Whitening Gel for just $24.95. 
Order in the next five minutes and buy one, get one absolutely free for just $24.95. That's two for one and save 58%. We'll even include free shipping. Get your teeth whiter guaranteed or return it within 60 days for your money back. I smile every day now. <laughs> The difference is literally night and day. So now I'm always smiling, always choosing, because now my teeth are much whiter. This offer is not available in stores, so call or click now before the special buy one, get one free offer goes away. A longtime business news editor at National Public Radio has been suspended by the network. He said that NPR has lost America's trust. Yuri Berliner wrote an essay in the online publication The Free Press, stating that NPR has a progressive worldview. NPR executives say he violated a company rule by not first getting permission before seeking outside work. In the essay, Berliner says NPR failed to properly cover certain stories, such as the now debunked allegations that former President Trump colluded with Russia in the run-up to the 2016 election. Some Republicans and media outlets are accusing the network of liberal bias. They are saying it should lose its public funding. Trump also blasted NPR on Truth Social, calling it a liberal disinformation machine. In an email to staffers, NPR editor-in-chief Edith Chapin defended the outlet's journalism standards. And dwelling prices and dwelling sales in China's property mar ma market, as well as Americans saving less. NTD's Don Ma has more on this with today's business brief. Okay, thank you very much, Steph. Uh, today we're talking about China's real estate sector. It looks like new home prices in China fell at their fastest pace in more than eight years in March. This comes as the debt woes of major property developers. Uh, they're continuing to drag on demand as well as the overall Chinese economic outlook. So specifically, China's property sector uh, accounts for nearly a quarter of the economy and new home prices in March dropped 2.2% from a year earlier. This is the biggest decline since August 2015. And analysts are saying that many of Chinese authorities' measures to prop up this troubled sector, uh, the policies are not having a significant impact. And declines in home prices worsened as well uh, year over year in Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 cities. It appears that the property glut is still continuing. Property investment worsened as well in China, according to state data. Now, back here in the U.S., Americans are saving less these days, it looks like. Their personal saving rate fell to 3.6% in February. And this is the lowest level, by the way, in more than a year. Uh, so as to why people are saving less, uh, there could be several factors here, Steph. It could be just a continuation of a long-term trend, uh, which is that historically, Americans tend to save less after a recession. Uh, but there are other factors as well. For example, pandemic-related stimulus plus a lack of spending during shutdowns caused savings to build up during the pandemic. But the strong job market also gave people more money to shell out, resulting in what economists call a structurally lower saving rate. That's all from me today. Back to you, Steph. All right. Thank you, Don. Five years ago, Parisians stood in shock as the Notre Dame Cathedral burned. Between tears and memories, the ordeal left an indelible mark on the city. NTD's France correspondent David Vivas has that story. I was standing here five years ago with hundreds of Paris residents who stopped walking in the streets. They stood still, watching as the medieval building burned. Some people shouted at the moment the spire collapsed, as if something was definitely broken. A memory that remains strong five years on. It was really intense, and when the spire fell, we had tears. And you can see that I still have emotions about it. Because I was born in Paris, like my husband, and we have childhood memories from this place, so it was hard. It was like seeing all the history of our ancestors that built it being shattered. A shock. A shock. I'm not a Christian, but wow, I think the cathedral would collapse. 
Across the river, Laurence Alcina was closing shop at her bookstand, one of the ubiquitous green stalls on the banks of the Seine, when she saw smoke rising from Notre Dame. As time passed, I wasn't feeling good at all, because I was thinking it was getting out of proportion. It was terrifying, terrifying. It was too much, too much. During the blaze, it was uncertain if the whole cathedral would eventually collapse. Donations from people across the globe poured in then. France's billionaires pledged aid to rebuild the cathedral. The donations have funded the $587 million reconstruction. The cathedral is set to reopen on December 8, 2024, the Feast of the Virgin Mary. David Dives, NTD News, Paris. Thank you for watching NTD Newsroom. I'm Stephanie Cox. We'll have more stories from the U.S. and around the world. Join Tiffany Meyer for the NTD Evening News at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific.